Welcome to the 27th annual Poetry and Music in the Garden. And um, last year we didn't hold the event because of the pandemic and all of the turmoil that was happening in the world and in our country. But um, today we're here in the garden to start the event, which will be a live Zoom event this year, remotely from the poets' homes. And uh, But I'm here with Oren Martin, the longtime manager of the Farm and Garden here at UCSC. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of this event to uh, us and to the community at large. So uh, welcome, Oren. And Thank you, Kurt. Welcome, all of you out there. And uh, the beginnings of the garden, I know when I was first an apprentice, we spent a whole day sitting here on the porch hearing Beth Nelson and Jim Nelson of Camp Joy tell the beginnings of the garden, how Chadwick got here. So what is your recollections of the beginnings of the, the garden? Well, they are fond recollections. Um, UCSC started in 1965. Alan Chadwick was enticed here to start the garden in 1967. And as the initial thrust of UCSC was in the humanities and arts, so that's our roots in the garden and then subsequently the farm. Uh, we come out of the humanities and the arts. Now you fast forward, let, well let me just also say that the garden was a response to students' respectful demands. They wanted something that could help them, so to speak, put down roots on this pristine landscape that was under huge construction, even as school started, there was a lot of dust and din and noise. And of course, we as a nation in the 60s, late 60s, were embroiled in political tumult. So they thought there could be a, an enclave, a, a sanctuary. And this was at the outset of the environmental movement. So these factors all came together. Chadwick was enticed, Chadwick came, and the garden was started. Now let's fast forward 53 years. That's how long the Chadwick Garden's been here. We now find ourselves ensconced in the sciences, the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, both the earth and atmospheric sciences, and appropriately so. And yet we still, as we are doing today, honor our roots. I see no contradiction between art and science, although those two communities are often at loggerheads with one another. They needn't be, because if you kind of look at their at at the attributes of an artist, the attributes of a scientist, there's very many similarities. They are looking for that which is real, the truth. They are dogged in, in pursuing it. They are equipped to deal with frequent failure. They have keen observational skills. And when they get a product, whatever that product is in the various disciplines, they share it with others. Uh, but today, we're wanting to honor the poets and hope that they can breathe song into word and verse as they are often inspired by the muse or the muses. <laughs> 27 years ago, uh, a group of us here at the, at the garden and the Friends of the Farm and Garden, um, we thought that we should hold an event that would speak to the muse and that the, the farm and garden was not just a place for uh, producing uh, future farmers and gardeners and flowers and vegetables, but was also a place of reflection <clears throat> and repose and um, inspiration and art. And that was the beginnings of the uh, Poetry and Music Festival that we've held every year since then, uh, except for last year. And I think this last year speaks to, uh, as much as ever, to the need of music and poetry to be part of the, the healing of our lives when so many people have been brokenhearted this year and so many people have passed away. And so I think this year um, is very poignant for the need of the music and poetry in the garden. And uh, uh, what, what does this day really mean to you? Well, it means quite a lot to me as do the other 364 days of the year. But this is flat out the best day of the year in the garden. Uh, we gardeners put down our tools, uh, drag a comb across our hair, find our cleanest dirty short shirt, come in and listen up. Um, and what I find is that there's just such a broad spectrum of both the university and the larger Santa Cruz community who, who come to this event. Um, 
and uh, it's also a very intergenerational event and I think we should try to emphasize the younger generation more with our poets as we go forward here. But for me, I go around and do all the cordial things, glad handing and welcoming people and all that. And then as we set up for the poets to read, I disappear right out back of me is a block of apple trees, usually not totally thin by early June. Uh, so I set up an eight foot ladder, I scramble up and I thin while I listen to the dulcet tones of the poets on the porch and I mean who's got it better than that? Well <laughs> what about you Kurt? Why, why do you like this event? Uh, well for all those same reasons and um, I, I enjoy uh, you know the community that comes and uh, being here on the Schley porch and uh, hosting the event um, and introducing the poets uh, and then like you stepping back and listening to uh, their insights and the poetry and the music that we that we have here um, and uh, this year we have uh, two poets that have been reading with us for as long as I've been hosting the event and uh, it is Michael Hannon and Lee Perrin um, and we're so happy that they're back again this year and then we have four uh, new poets that have never read here before that we're very excited to listen to and uh, so uh, usually we're here on the porch and many of the poets say this is their favorite venue to, to read in anywhere in the world and um, so today we are not going to be here with the poets but we wanted to give you a little flavor of, of the garden setting um, that Orn and I are in and um, hope that the poetry will bring us to this place, to the garden um, that's not just here but, but in our hearts. And um, I think in this year we, we need that. We need that. <laughs> so. I've got a little something. I'm going to play the stern schoolmaster, y'all come up, sit in the front row, you sit up straight and you listen up. You're going to learn stuff, you're going to be inspired. <laughs> <laughs>
and the founding editor of two literary endeavors, Chef Poetry, an online journal, journal for experimental poetry, and Jami um, Publishing, which is an independent press dedicated to poets and writers involved in community service projects. She's authored two chapbooks, Sis, Fuss, and Ladies, Please, were published in 2013. Her work has been published in Iowa Review, 491, Saranap, Pearl, Sugar House, Welter, and Vinyl. Santa Cruz is fortunate that Nakia now lives among us. She teaches at Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz, California. Nakia. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, truly, truly appreciated. And thank you, everyone who's here and who invited me as a newer poet um, to come and be a part of this gorgeous, gorgeous reading. Uh, I loved everything that was said in the video about the garden. I tend to think of the garden as these soft spaces um, in which we can rest and be gentle, but learning that this garden uh, came from the 60s and came out of those movements is especially, um, it connects to me deeply. So I'm going to read a few from my, uh, my full length collection, Us Now, and then I'm gonna just end with a few newer poems um, at the end. So my full length collection of poetry is Us Now. And when I wrote this book, I wanted to think about everything that the mouth does. Um, the mouth is this hole that goes through our entire body. We chew, we eat, we drink, we kiss, we talk, we taste all with our mouths. And I just thought of this call for connection. I kept wanting to have connection. So this first poem, Boy at Lake, um, is about this beautiful, beautiful man, this black man that I saw standing in the water at Lake Tahoe. And I knew I had to run home and write about it. Boy at Lake. Perhaps his shoulders, back expanding, he like brown trout could have used torso to see nearer and clear rocks soaping toe and thigh to blue. He turns to push body, basin to brush, knee to back of neck, to move tail, to move gill, to breathe the cold honesty of just wanting it. He does not swim, he stands, his wings edged tips towards the beach where I question the dive and the borders and why this wall of mountains past the center, why these palms pressed on his silver skin. Where is this calm, this blessed bedding, this always framed lake and want and boy. This next poem uh, is a poem that I sometimes perform. Um, it's a little different when I perform it, but it's simply about being on that water and rocking back and forth slowly and how calm that feels and how good that feels but how sometimes it's not enough. Consider this child adrift. A leg spools a solitary foot out to the lake, tapping slow circles on the surface, daring the unnecessary. One single foot, one small limb, one small purchase, and tenderness that reflects and shifts the green down to the coldness of a questioned measure. As if that stiff limb dared to gather the whole of the body up to dive thick and proud into the water to become a seed, to become a tiny silver fish a child slow learn to walk, a woman whispering, maybe a girl realizing she could be, just maybe, some part of beauty 
as real as the weeds touching and cradling the tiny craft. This always spools around her because this space, this water, does not send out its cold fingers to pierce or scratch the hide. No, it just radiates each touch, calms you down, makes it slow. Where she, this child, is yes, testing the water, but the moment too, lazy in its hum of possibility, its tiny pieces bobbing, buoyant, free. And also from Us Mouth, um, the last poem from Us Mouth. And again, you know, sometimes I write these poems just because I'm lonely. <laughs> and for this one, I just wanted to make someone, right? I just wanted to make a companion. And I just wondered, how would you do that? How would you build someone to sit next to you, right? It's possible. Well, maybe. The Woven Man. Taken very broadly, these views are not mutually exclusive, since a woven man can be both cloth and wood. His form could be bought maybe with the price of a look that lasts for four full seconds if one courts the quick peak and inability to see spoked feet. Taken to extremes, the fabric of this man or the bark of this man or the hood of this man should be made into a pattern stole stiff by kneading the, thre the thread slowly, by pouring the flesh and touching by trial to an abstract idea, then maybe back to fiber and wood. Him peering through the sheer lace of you like a memory of an experience of a taste. Him watching as you wash the mud with pitcher and cup. Him as essential as the color of the skin. Him branching one straight arm into the fiber of muscle of an exquisite sensation that is something close to pure pain or gratification or salt or cantaloupe or gravel or bruise you must work until you are stiff, until your joints are rippling ink and the quill droops, or at least until the inability to make the effort of the shape consumes you. But my dear, if you cheat and use knife or tool, then the question of this woven man and these old memories and your hopes and dreams, wet leaves, black as peach pit, stories of how it could be might wobble on the bench, might spill on the carpet, might make you unjustified. For this shape can be too soft to be plastic and too stark to be concrete. Remember, you are making an issue and it is not your failing, but just the learning of proper technique. So I'm gonna read uh, just a few new ones. I know I gotta go fairly quickly. I wanna get um, the other poets in here. I'm so excited to hear from some of these other poets. Um, but I do have a new book, a new collection of poetry called To Stir And. Um, and I'm just thinking about the way we stir things up, right? You wanna stir things up, but it feels good to stir. Um, and I'll just read one poem from here. And then one piece that I really thought I'd love to share with you guys. So this is untitled, um, and we'll just go where it goes. How do you do it? How do you shake the hands of the mules, ask the god of it to come down and sip wine on the porch? What if you don't drink wine or have a porch? What if you couldn't make it yesterday because the getting up out of bed was too hard? What if you didn't sleep and all the want of it? is laid out on your tomorrow, blinking like a mouth hungry in the ear, or an ocean culling your own breath. Whatever you are, whatever it is up there, no, I have a question. I am walking on sheet metal. I am opening doors, and I want to know the worth of these teeth 
that unfurl like the ugly parts of balloons. I want to remember learning to speak. I want the calm and your treachery, your silence is needling me. So you can hush even though I'm asking the questions royally because this pain I haven't asked you to handle me and the shame is enough. And how do you do it? What would you say? Maybe I don't care because haven't we done this already? And for my last poem, um, I am an artist that likes to work with things on the page uh, and lots of images and lots of texts that are doing funny things. But I also love the sounds of the words. Um, and I heard a song and it just stayed with me and stayed with me and stayed with me. And so I took the first refrain of that song and I wrote a crown which is um, a series of poems. And I'll just read a little bit of it. But I don't think you guys would have the same experience unless you heard the song. So I hope you don't mind if I sing it just a little bit. And this is Drinking Muddy Water. Black woman be the mule of the earth. She been drinking muddy water, but she know what she worth. Any woman be the mule of the earth with a mindset on freedom, cause she know what she worth. Black woman, just out here thirsting with her crayon and her score all giddy enough to dance on the north sides of forest pine. Green shouting pale steel aways, but grabbing it always by the waist. A dance in the dink shack with flat granite feet. She be answering phones and little screams that scream her name. Octaves dropped fast while pant greets each ping with smile. For if even she wanders, she can always lick the envelope. Will the white wander ride in her chariot of cream gold like the shape of a star was etched on the boulevard just for her saying black woman baby girl you just out here swimming like crawl you just out here doing your thing be the mule be the mule be the mule of this to make dirt the dregs of her coils be the mule that switched to shore to break be the mule the dirt is green vines lashed baked into the batter butter of each hustle be the mule of this to make it be hard and we know this fake winding of man and toil is just jostle that switch to shore to break so be the mule bend it back to her to take crown gone in the fat inevitable rustle of this be the mule of this to break the earth the earth She's weeping, maybe, but I think she be laughing, saying each fool that pressed the chest ain't fast enough to slip the bite. And since she don't have teeth, well, then it must be a private juggling, a memory to poke and rib that keeps her out of whatever's in their diaper, the earth coughing up plastic or plastique because we love to blowing everything up. Even if she's curled old, and small doesn't matter because we used, we used, we used her up and took her toil to our own beds to fluff shuffle our shoulders like there would always be this rusty room to come back to this plate done cracked. The earth, it cracked open and she passed on sweet and soft as gum. What she worth is this bird, our bullet balanced, the hollow point of slug that pierces a plump body, waving its footprints in moss or gray earth. What she worth is this fish. See that thing swimming there? Popcorn thin colored balls of glide where river water too is as blue as the sunlit path. What she worth is this fight banners and names in the pocket, aching feet, the swell of a chant that becomes a kind of remedy for at least it cradles the rage. What she worth is this time because Cure picked up its skirts to run away last night and all that's left to do is prick the muscle with styluses made of weak bark. What she worth 
is what she worth all and nothing and all and more. And she, black woman, be the mud of the earth, water in her mouth, all this carpet and dirt and everything at her feet, caressing each mule toe, delicate. What she worth is drinking her up, making her into everything. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, and I'm going to be introducing the next poet. Um, so we have the most wonderful William Ward Butler. He is a writer and educator from Northern California. He's the author of the chapbook, Life History from Ghost City Press. And he will be graduating from UC Santa Cruz Master's in Education Credential Program in July. He has received support from the Napa Valley Writers Conference, the Catamaran Writers Conference, and the Wellstone Center in Redwood. So it's my pleasure to introduce William Ward Butler. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nakia. I loved your poems. It was so good to hear you read. And I was actually just listening to your interview um, on the High Poetry Collective. Um, I really enjoyed that interview and your poems. Um, and I'm glad to be here. And for everyone um, who helped make this event happen um, and for all of you for attending, there are a lot of you and um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm gonna try to do something with technology real quick. Um, and I'm going to copy and paste uh, something in the chat. And what I'm copying and pasting is a link to um, my website, but it has um, the poems that I'm going to read. So if you are someone who likes to have the text of something in front of you um, while you're hearing it, you can click on that link that should be appearing in the chat and you can see um, the poems that I'll read. So I hope that is um, an option that people um, find helpful. And I'm gonna read uh, my first poem um, right now. So thank you. Uh, this poem is called Evening. At the end of my block, a silhouetted couple shares a cigarette. Its orange tip glows like the street light outside my childhood home. Their closeness makes me think I will always be lonely. I used to be thrilled by possibility. Now I'm afraid of choice. Dear friends, if life is what you make it, that's what makes it terrifying. Whenever a bus passes filled with people who won't know my name, I am glad to be anonymous. Tonight, when the animal that lives in my walls is quiet, I can't decide if it's a sign. The grass in the field hasn't been cleared since last summer. It brings together the vermin and birds of prey. When the mice look up to an owl descending upon them, why wouldn't they think it's the face of God? Thank you. I'm going to take a sip of my diet ginger ale. Thank you, everybody. Um, and I'm going to uh, read my second poem. Um, that first poem was the first poem that appears in um, my chat book called Life History that was uh, released last year. Looks like this. Um, I was really happy with it and glad to have it in the world. Um, I'm about to read a poem that I wrote fairly recently. I think I've had a lot of people asking, you know, and maybe I think this is maybe an experience that a lot of people who are reading today have been um, experiencing. People ask, you know, during the pandemic, have you been writing? How much have you been writing? And I feel like I've been writing a little bit and it hasn't often coalesced into a poem, but um, I think this one did. And this is kind of looking back on um, a previous summer um, before COVID, I think. Um, so this poem uh, is called Artifice. Like everyone else, 
I am trying not to think about suffering. The radio tells me to live it up, even though living is absurd, what Camus called the unreasonable silence of the world. Last summer, I spent one week alone in a cabin and had no epiphany or change in my habits. On the last day, I drove into town for pizza and startled myself when I spoke a single sentence. The TV was filled with golfers looking mean. On commercial breaks, it rained Reese's pieces from high heaven and the street outside was filled with August light. It was clear that what I wanted most in life wasn't money or to know God, but time. All along East Cliff, the surfers crashed into waves again and again, like they knew a truth about being alive that most people don't. Now, when the late afternoon light spills onto my tile floor like a new ocean, I'm curious. I want to dive. I would like to drown. Thank you. That was my second poem. I'm gonna take another sip of ginger ale. Um, I was gonna to say too, I'm really happy to be a part of this event. Um, I'm a two time, almost now, uh, alumnus of UC Santa Cruz. I went there for my undergrad um, where I studied literature and education. And now I'm back in the um, master's of education program. I'm getting a teaching credential. Um, and that program finishes um, next month in July. Um, so I'll be twice um, twice a graduate of UC Santa Cruz. So I'm happy to be um, part of this event and uh, in connection with um, the garden at UCSC, which I really appreciated. And um, yeah, um, the video is lovely. I'm thinking about it right now. Um, this next poem is, um, uh, kind of, it's, it's a letter to a beloved um, inanimate object, I guess. Um, this next poem is called, Dear, I Can't Believe It's Not Butter, letter number two. You're still in the back of my fridge, lonely as God. This is how we're similar. At times, we've resigned to let the heat of this world ruin us, we may or may not be genetically modified. We've both been judged based on what we are not. I know it doesn't matter. You don't care that I'm composed of fistfuls of carbon, just like it doesn't bother me that you consist of soybean oil and salt. I'm writing to let you know that I'm still moved by beauty in unexpected places. Last year, I went to an orchestra performance in a room filled with wires. When the violinists finished playing their instruments, they started to play the wire, a single note, held it, then cut the wire, which released one final sound. I cried in that audience of strangers. I've never attended a house of worship, but seek grace in all things. I take eight vitamins every day. I'm 25 and have entered a phase of life that has not always been filled with the delight I feel when I gaze upon you, my savory substitute, leaning against a jar of expired pickles like a stoic. Dear not butter, I can't claim to know how old you are, but I'm glad to know you all the same my imaginary dairy, my condiment of imitation, my simulacrum of joy. Thank you. Another sip. Um, thank you, everybody. I see the chat. That's really nice. Um, I, I wrote that poem kind of um, thinking about things in my poem that I expressed uh, gratitude for. So it kind of started off by thinking like, I appreciate you washing machine um, and sort of arriving at um, 
the I can't believe it's not butter and having it also kind of a letter to yourself or expressing things you wouldn't express in a letter. So people want to try that as a poetry prompt. I know that there are some poets um, not only reading, but in attendance tonight. Um, it's a fun one to express appreciation for an object, write a letter to it, and you can really be um, free in, in that letter, um, expressing your appreciation. Um, this is going to be my last poem. And I am uh, coming to you live from the Santa Cruz Mountains right now. Um, but I'm moving out soon and I'm moving to Los Gatos where I will be teaching in a middle school. Um, and I'm really excited about it. I'll still be in the area, um, but I'll be teaching middle school. Um, shout out to possibly some of my colleagues in the audience tonight. Um, so I was thinking about just kind of the experience of living in the Santa Cruz mountains and um, how that in itself is sometimes a journey. Um, and how it's how it's been. I've lived here for about four years with my boyfriend and we've really enjoyed it mostly. And there have been things that have been um, unexpected, I guess. So this is sort of um, looking back on the time that we have lived in the mountains here. And maybe it's also a sneaky love poem. He's like in the other room. So he's going to hear this, um, which is fine. Um, but this poem is called Reading Kavafi by Candlelight. The storm we've been fearing hit tonight. It brought down redwoods and power lines and half a mile away, a transformer exploded, sending up blue sparks bright as a fallen star. I'm glad to live with you here in these mountains, even though awful things have happened. When that car flipped and littered the road with glass, when the sky was filled with smoke all November, when you were so sick, the state of California called and I drove you to urgent care for intravenous fluids. Now, this storm threatens to flood our small apartment and there's nothing to do but wait on the couch with you in the dark. This must be what straight couples think of when they're told for better or worse. We haven't talked about marriage, but next month marks five years together, a length of time that once seemed impossible. Who am I without you in my life? The answer like a burning wick I love you with all my insufficient words. Thank you, everybody. One last sip. Thank you so much. Um, those are the poems that I will be reading. Um, as a reminder, this is my chapbook. It's called Life History. Um, it's out from Ghost City Press. If you scroll up, um, the link is there um, for ordering and more information. Um, I've really appreciated being a part of this reading and I'm going to introduce our next poet. And our next poet is going to be Michael Hannon. Michael Hannon has been writing and publishing poetry for 61 years. His work has appeared in journals and anthologies both here and abroad. Much of his work has been published by California's leading book artists in limited editions. Michael's 30 year collaboration with the artist William T. Wiley has produced books, sculptures, and numerous gallery and museum shows. He is the author of 35 poetry titles, including six full-length poetry collections. Three of Michael's books are currently available on Amazon. Those books are Imaginary Burden, Selected Poems, Who on Earth, New Poems, and The Muse Turns Her Back. And I believe he may also have a new book that he can also talk about as well. And I'm going to pass it over to Michael Hannon. Uh, thank you, Billy, for introducing me. And thank you for your poems. Uh, we share some experiences. With me, it was a pound of lard. And it was in the uh, Berkeley Co-op in 1964. I became transfixed. And I was reading Cavafé this morning. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to read Idiot Wind, a poem in 11 little parts 
that I wrote during the winter of 2020. I think that that wind has always been blowing, but things certainly picked up in 2016. This poem was the work that got me beyond my anger and hatred. Thanks to Nancy Dahl, my wife, for Zoom assistance, and a deep bow to Key Francis for publishing this poem in a letterpress edition, along with his prints that fit the poem perfectly. Uh, there it is. Hoop Snake Press, Tupelo, Mississippi. There must be a website. I am a Luddite, so I wouldn't know. All right, Idiot Wind. The epigraph is from the ancient Greek Lycon. Nothing but laughter, nothing but dust, nothing but nothing, no reason why it happens. Crows think they own the ancient oak. When they all leave at once, I know the sharp shinned hawk has set her ambush for the doves. The doves sing all afternoon, cooing sweetly to each other as if alone in paradise. I've spent the day in bed, the hawk just outside my window, hidden, she thinks, in the oak. Now I'm falling half asleep, chronic maladies deliciously erased, lulled by the witless dove. Fleur du Mal, bright buttercups, eye jelly, a black floater burning a hole in light's fabric. Death is hunting us. Heavy showers last night, the busted rain gutter still dripping, the rain gauge half full, half empty. How brave life must be with its strange days and human heart. Old age and its bad companions, fatigue and exhaustion, summer leaves that fall all summer. Extinct volcanoes marching inland, earthy waves of battlement and lawn, rainbow on a distant sombrero. The mad king and his carrion cloud make a big noise, all weeds and dust. Far away, a wonderful boy plays just two songs on his father's funky trombone, sea of grass and windy hill. All afternoon, the boy draws on the cover of his binder with blue indelible ink, a rattlesnake, a runaway horse, an odalisk, a boat. Then he writes a girl's name, repeats it ad nauseum until he runs out of binder. A little circle of energy is moving through the trees. The failing tree cast its shadow on the Balinese frog team. Pot metal, frog patina, the conductor in his pit trying to keep time. 
the new music, the zombies, the COVID dead, the old days gone forever. After five years, a single trumpet flower on the trumpet vine, a vermilion solitary smothered in deep purple, morning glories. Freezer trucks back up to the moor, tapping the overflow. Troco playing jazz in hell's parking lot. Pandemic blue. For some reason, throughout the last five years, hellish years, uh, I keep thinking of Troco and uh, his, uh, his terrible life and his beautiful poetry and his love of the color blue. So often when people talk to me on the phone and say, how are you? I say, I've got the blues or I'm blue. The baby rabbit, its bowels pierced by a pointy stick, screams terror through the garden's certain doom. Mother rabbit, a statue in a shrubbery. I am a political animal, a gardener, and the gardening is murder. I am the ignorant red electorate. Life and death are fake numbers. The elephant seal butchered in his sleep. The gardener hoist with his own petard. My poem is shut like the lips of a coffin. Green water over the plunging white bow. A small boat far from shore beats its way against the world's deep will. Even in summer, the beach here is bone cold, swept by an idiot wind. Children in skimpy suits dare the edge of everything, sharp dune or cresting wave. The horizon runs away to an invisible other side, the sea bigger than heaven. Light years, dark matter, fire on the mountain. Last fingerprint, last breath. Well, good. What was hidden by seeing will have nowhere to hide. Soul, a likely story. Words, a frightful blunder. A young red tree burgeons in the old tree's wrinkled arms. A woman holds her face up to the sun. Wild energy ruins the planet. Things as they are, things as they seem to be, have no meaning. That is why they are sacred. Black moonlight a big frog full of crickets, some of them still singing. Thank you. And thank you, Michael Hannon. You always manage to release spirit from the here and now. I love that you're here and you've been here for many years. And right now um, I'm going to read a poem I happen to have written it. It's titled To Grow an Organic Garden. Oh, excuse me, no, it's not. It's, it's titled To Grow an Organic Farmer. And it's dedicated to my son, Joe, who is a graduate of the UCSC Apprenticeship Training Program and a student of Oren's. To grow an organic farmer, you must step in when grandparents advise your son to get a job with Dow Chemical, since he's so interested in agriculture. 
You must help fix water pumps, put up deer fencing, remind him in spring to get a haircut, pluck strawberries at their plump stems before morning sun's wilting. To raise an organic farmer, you must offer a prayer while he loads his first Kubota on the flatbed in threadbare keds. You must decorate the refrigerator with photos from the local paper. Frame the one of him striding between rows, Cipollini onions draped across his arms, a harem of swooning bulbs. To grow an organic farmer, you must share his faith in soil seeds handled gently, invent recipes for turnips, even if you don't like turnips. You must fill in at the farmer's market when tomatoes avalanche, memorize prices, so when customers force red kale, kiosha beets, and cranberry beans upon you, you might even make the correct change. And when he asks, Mom, do you think I can make money at this? answer absolutely now um there's a reason that i read that the poem appears in this book the chadwick garden anthology of poets which is a collection of poets by 31 authors who've read at this event over the years from michael hannon and lee perrin julie alter nate mackey amber sumrall and gary young to name just a few the Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden is offering this book as a gift to those of you who care to donate $100 or more to the Friends of the Farm and Garden. You'll automatically become a member of the Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden, which importantly is a nonprofit whose mission is to support the apprenticeship program in organic, sustainable, and socially just farming. If you're moved to do so, just check that link in the chat box that Delise put up. That was my call to action. Our next poet is Julie Murphy. Julie is a host for the Hive Poetry Collection, broadcast live on radio KSQD 90.7 FM. Her poems appear or are forthcoming coming in New Ohio Review Online, Atlanta Review, Massachusetts Review, Calix, Swim, Common Ground Review, and the Louisville Review among other journals. Her book of poems is forthcoming. Julie is a licensed psychotherapist who developed embodied writing and she teaches poetry as a volunteer at Salinas Valley State Prison. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Robin. And thanks to Vanessa who's there in the background with all the magic keeping us going and Delise and the many friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden. Um, it's such a beautiful place. And if you haven't been there, please make a field trip and go. It's, it's magic. Um, the gardens and uh, poetry have uh, sustained me and comforted me and inspired me for uh, so many years. And uh, especially during this past year. So I'm really honored to be reading tonight um, as far as this program and in um, such great company with um, these other amazing poets. So mm -hmm. thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> just a little note, I will be reading from um, my manuscript and um, just to be forewarned, these are poems of love and grief. Uh, the first poem I'll read is entitled, My Husband's Martin. Sitka spruce top, rosewood body, ebony fingerboard inlaid with abalone, the Martin guitar he coveted for years. So different than the vintage Stratocaster with its whammy bar or the electric bass backbone of his blues band. Later, he wondered why he waited, said it was a dream to play. His mood revealed in chords clean or throaty, sweep-picked arpeggios, the rhythm, swing or straight. When the house became silent, I took it in my arms, pressed the body against my belly, slid my hand down the neck to the cutaway, 
plucked the strings. Let the rich tones reverberate through my torso. I rested my cheek on the upper bout, smelled the raw wood, and then I kissed the length of the Martin's curved side, eased it into its lined case, the blood red velvet. Um, the working title of my manuscript is I'm Not Any of the Things I Used to Be, and I'm going to read um, a number of poems that are um, at least all originally entitled uh, with the same name and numbered. And um, I was in a workshop with uh, Naomi Shihab Nye, and uh, I, I said, as an introduction of myself, I said, I'm not any of the things I used to be. And she suggested I take this statement and write it on the top of 50 pages in my journal and write a new poem under each one. And so uh, that really opened up the floodgates of this collection of poems. And I'm really grateful to Naomi for her heart and kindness and also for um, this suggestion. So when you catch yourself saying something, try this out, write it on a bunch of blank pages and uh, riff off of it. I'm not any of the things I used to be 22. 50 days since you died, I lie in bed, watch the rain fall. This morning, unable to get up. Last night, unable to sleep. Every light burning as I wandered empty room to empty room until dawn. I might look over at the redwood grove or next to the window, the dresser turned shrine. It bears the weight of your ashes, sealed in a black plastic box, draped in the kata you wore at our wedding, the white silk trailing down like a loose limb. And the bronze Quan Yin, goddess of compassion, set beside your portrait, the one with your cheek tipped into your open palm, your smile so at ease. You're looking right at me, no bruises mar your fine features. Three offering bowls of water, the bay branches used to bless us at your memorial, the wristwatch you wore every day, leather band creased around the third notch. Your reading glasses whole, their case crushed in the accident. You probably slipped it in your shirt pocket before you left. Loose change, guitar picks, driver's license, all from the envelope the funeral director placed in my unsteady hands. Your wedding band, the waves delicately engraved in white gold, still so lovely. The seventh day, the seventh seven-day candle guttering in pale morning light. I'm not any of the things I used to be, 52. Was it perverse to light the wood stove while the power was cut for fire danger? I could take cold, but not cold and dark. Maybe that's why I like to burn the candle by your urn. I remember how cold your feet were in bed. I remember something each time I strike the match, bring it to the wick. Like the night I raced you home, stripped my clothes as I drove, flipped the top of the hot tub, slipped in as you pulled up, the moon shining from the surface of the water. Um, my, my husband, Bill, and I had a ritual on our anniversaries. We would have a, a really nice meal, and then we would read our wedding vows um, that we very carefully wrote to each other. And we'd celebrate the vows that we excelled in, and we brainstormed about the vows that we were hmm, not so great about. And, um, and then we worked towards forgiveness about the rest. Uh, so um, our anniversary came around um, 
only two weeks after my husband died. And so I carried on the tradition on my own. And then this uh, next poem uh, comes from that. I'm not any of the things I used to be, 36. And of the vows we made for this moment, joy that we met, joy of what we shared, oh, terrible joy. Um, thanks for all your comments in the tat chat. That's uh, really so nice. Um, I, I've traveled a lot over the years, and um, there's always um, there's always strange things that happen in airports that surprise us. And uh, this uh, poem is uh, set in and entitled um, after the uh, Cincinnati. Northern Kentucky International Airport. The suitcase slipped off the ridged, start over. The suitcase slipped off the ridged edge of the escalator, bounced twice, then hurtled two stories down. And lucky it was early morning, two days after Christmas. Lucky no one stood along the sides, no one passed the escalator's gaping mouth as the luggage shot through, its landing a thunderclap, a crescendo. The charcoal-colored carry-on skidded across the floor and stopped, lucky, just short of the electric train tracks. Its handle splintered, stuck straight up like a spear. Lucky Though packed tight, it didn't burst. No display of gold cable knit sweater, panties, pajamas, not my late husband's Wrigley Field sweatshirt. Lucky, even if I had to carry it by hand, shifting right to left through the vaulted corridors. That year, after my husband was killed in a car crash, I had to collect each shard of fortune turn it over in my palm like a piece of glass, repeat the word to convince myself. I stood there under the fluorescent lights among strangers, the day not yet broken. Now grief is um, such a solo journey. It's different for each of us and um, as you probably know, every day uh, it's always changing. So uh, even though we have to go through it alone and on our own, I'm just so grateful for the loving kindness and generosity of my family and friends and my fellow poets. Um, I wouldn't have made it through these recent years without you. And um, this next poem is dedicated to my mother, Jean, who's here listening and I do have her permission to read it. Um, and I, I, my mom is just the sweetest and kindest person I've ever known. Um, this uh, poem is called uh, The Half-Life of Grief. And now my mother is the person I call when I can't get out of bed. And it's already after 10 where I am now at the end of the second year when I'm not crying every second but wish I could. And when she says, I know, her tone is so kind, as if all the kindness in the world is concentrated in the quiet timber of her 93 years, as if it's turned to roses, pink, like her cheeks and her cashmere sweater, its fullness, the honeyed petals of the peace rose, the spicy center of the flower, and then there's a bit of rough edge somewhere down near her voice box that tears at her words like thorns would. And because the whole flower of kindness is in her voice, not some sweet platitude, I can get out of bed late as it, late as it is, careful to mute the phone so she doesn't hear the covers turning over or my steps on the stairs the coffee canister opening, muting and unmuting as we remember our dead husbands, the nights rolling dark and numberless before us. Uh, 
Thank you. And um, I'm going to end tonight uh, with a poem um, that uh, was um, included in James Cruz's um, beautiful anthology on how to love the world, poems of gratitude and hope. And um, if you're not familiar with this anthology, go find it. It's just got such encouraging and comforting and beautiful poems in it. Um, and just thank you everyone so much. This poem is entitled, To Ask. To wear your dead husband's sweatshirt long after his scent has faded, the cotton soft, wrist and waistbands frayed, the white wriggly field still bright. To pull the hood over your head, nestle into the darkness the way he would on a cold night. To conjure him, slideshow of your lives playing in the background, shot by shot, as if this cloth could incarnate the self who wore it day after day, year after year, or the self who you were, to be that self for an instant, glimpse whatever it was, joy, sorrow that made you whole, to know yourself forever changed, glimpse or no glimpse, gone forever. To not know in this vast space of grief who you ever could become. And ask who, without despair, to ask with hope. Um. Thank you again, and um, I'd love to introduce our next reader, uh, Lee Perrin. Lee Perrin lives in Santa Rosa, California, where he has hiked and written poems for 24 years. In 2009, after 10 years of research, he produced his first tome, a scholarly bibliography of the book publications by the great San Francisco poet, Kenneth Rexroth. His recent books and chapbooks include Celtic Light in 2013, 14 Poems of Transparence in 2013, North American Sweet Daydreams at Night in 2015, The World of Hypnos 2019, and a translation of Rene Char's poetic volume in 33 Pieces in 2007. Um, welcome, Lee. Thank you, Julie. Can people hear me? Could, I hope I'm standing a bit away from the phone, from the uh, TV. About um, 20 plus years ago, I wanted to do a quick tour of uh, Napa wineries. I wanted to do three and wind up in Calistoga at noon. So I left very early and I got to Whitehall Lane Winery, 9.30. And I was the only person in there except for the wine pourer. So we had a pretty good conversation and he poured me a Merlot, an ounce and a half of Merlot. I drank it. What do I know about bouquet and aroma and finish and all that? But what I could tell was that it had an interesting tactile sensation to my tongue and I really liked it. And I set the glass down and said, hmm, dust. And the guy almost jumped out of his skin. Yes, that's called Canero's dust. It's our trademark. That explains uh, the first line in, the, in, in my first poem. The court, and it was shortly after that that I spent, started spending time with a woman who was to become my wife. The courtship of Judy White. A good Merlot is equal parts blood and dust. And when the alchemist takes his, sets his spigot into the throat of this valley's mild behemoth, the bloodline flows in an almost eternal fall. You and I climb the valley ridge and stone sober stand in the anteroom of an old wilderness. <clears throat> Escarpments, low clouds, trails flooded with rain and another wilderness too, the one where so much can hurt, but sometimes in a pleasant way like the pure voluptuousness of not knowing what the other person is thinking. How would you like to fall blindly into the hands of one another's fate? And 
In blindness, you will taste your character and your dust. This from the winemaker who waits and smiles and smiles and waits. This poem also takes a little preamble. <coughs> Excuse me. I happen to share a birth date with three very good poets and I don't claim to be their equal except in having the same birthday. Emily Dickinson, uh, Carolyn Kaiser, and Nellie Socks. The date is December 10. What is December 10? Um, no holidays. I can tell you what December 10 is, it's nothing. It's cold and blistery, but it isn't even winter. That's another 10, 12 days down the calendar. It's autumn, but where are the red, yellow, orange leaves? They're not on the trees, they're not on the ground. I'll tell you where they are. Uh, they're in the mud and that's it, they're gone. Still, that period from December 1 to the solstice is very, very special to me. Um, solstice meaning the standing still of the sun. And I would go, I have often gone off into the hills at that time and just stayed there for hours, feeling the standing still of everything. A very haunting sense for me. The light arrested. When we have passed the day of the dead and have seen the light drawn out thin on the horizon like vague ships and night and cold are two kings on the land and the third enters the Pacific Ocean raising itself in colossal waves silently over the western slopes flooding the earth and reaching the plains of the interior. Then our hearts then our hearts are fish in a trackless ocean. And with the wide open eyes of fish and of seers, we understand that this is heaven, this cold motionless place and the light arrested. And everything we see, the fields and fences and the trees and the surging fog is filled with luminosity and presentness just as it was before the start of time. I revised this poem, so I'll, I'll read this one uh, instead of reciting. New England Rhapsody. You were little more than a girl of 20 when I was sending poems on frail chips of wood for you to wear in your hair at the grand affairs of Boston. Your black mass of hair that wouldn't lie down or go to sleep, though we slept, for sure we slept, and took our time in waking. Now you return in a lucid dream, childless amid the ruins of youth, and though a failed goddess, a goddess still. Never arraigning me, you ask, why we take so long to wake up or not sleep forever? Karma. We must wait a long while, sometimes 40 and 50 years, and each of us alone until karma is ready to look us in the eye. Lady of sweet time, beyond the vineyards, wandering among the cottages and orchards and fields where you gather smooth stones and illuminate days and nights with artifacts of the way. Raucous and bright-eyed are you, sharp-tongued, sad, well, I always knew that when at last we kissed, your mouth would taste of ripe fruit and wasps, and your hair is as much confusion as fecundity, and I won't find myself until I've found my hands entangled in her. When two people, ordinary and shy, 
finally do encounter themselves in each other's eyes. Life doesn't lose one ounce of its cruelty. Only what power in that long trembling gaze by candlelight in an uncertainty's cabin. This is called the Geyserville Flats. And it begins with a quotation or at least a paraphrase of a quotation, quotation from Egyptian mythology. And I think it's a creation myth. It goes like this. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then one day, a mother duck went looking for her eggs and she found the world. The Geyserville Flats, late May, the quavering voices of red wings fills more and more of the marshy meadows behind my house. They're brave souls, these birds. They fend off crows and herons and me with their distractions and their indignations. But when the farmer, when the rancher comes to harvest his field, chicks and nests fall with the hay and Viking, <laughs> Vikings, and vultures spend a glad day among the mowings. Monday he bails it. The bales keep skipping off his conveyor. I can hear him from half a mile away shouting at his help. Several of the bales will have surprises inside, beaks and claws and pieces of broken shell. These are little gods that powerlessly exist and the world the world is the found world it was not made and the finding force is grief who comes to us like a new lover and lo the stricken parents are moving toward a new courtship in the june dusk thank you The next poet, <clears throat> her name rhymes with shy flower, and it's Kim Scheiblauer. And she's a frequent member and, and reads at the Santa Cruz uh, Celebration of the Muse. She's been published by Porter Gulch Review and Molly Fisk's anthology, California Fire and Water. She has a poem, recent poem, a uh, book called The Visitant, which is her de uh, debut book of poetry. And it's set partially in the landscape of Wales. I've never been to Wales, uh, but I have a Wales. And I have a feeling Wales and southwestern England have a landscape similar to the wilder parts of Northern California. Meanwhile, she lives peacefully and quietly with her husband in the light-filled SoCal, uh, SoCal uh, hills among tall cypresses and California oaks. Kim Scheinblower. Uh, thanks, Lee. Oh, thank you too, Robin, and your cohorts, and Vanessa in the background um, for including me and taking care of us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, my husband tells me that in baseball terminology, I'm the cleanup batter. So I'm bringing up um, the end, and I'm just going to have a just a handful of poems for everybody. Uh, my first poem is about fire. I feel like I should perhaps warn some people. And uh, it's after Boland's poem, This Moment. At dusk. No, not dusk. Smoke. Not dusk. Midday. Yet, Nightlight flickers on, radiates like red algae tied low along the floor. Things are going to happen or have out of our sight. Distant embers burrow into peat, centuries worth of russet pine needles gone gray, gone thick tinder. The blur that crawls towards us over our ridge smells of burnt tire singe, sour plastic, moths to a mammoth flame. Fruit flies, little black stars, 
dizzy around the browning apple, their planet, but not yet. Trees, black silhouettes craped in smoke. Windows, the vacant eyes painted by soot and ash, not yet. We are now just eyes, masked. Stars emerge, unseen. That has happened. Moths flit, papery galaxies in retreat. Fallen away from pit, stone, the blighted fruit clings in fragments to their dark gleaming centers. I think I was superstitious and thought if I did read a poem about fire, maybe it wouldn't happen this year. It, it could work. Uh, this poem is the title poem of the book, which is The Visitant. It's in three little parts. It's Celtic. That's what happens. The Visitant. One. For her disdain, I thank my grandmother. Without the turn from her past, I would not know one word in her mother's tongue, such as the word kiss God, which means shadow, how in Welsh it also means shelter. Could this be a summoning to enter the dark spaces? Start with my ancestors who lowered into the dim, deep, chambers carrying their own light. Bless their blackened faces, hands, their guttering lungs. Two, I'm grateful for her refusals, my grandmother's evasions, shades that ghosted my journey to Cardiff. Tucked in with Dylan Thomas's book, Deaths and Entrances, Two small abalone shells lifted from our murky sea. Smooth insides lustered by a century's rough salt. White mineral edges beginning to crumble. My cousin tells me that her granddad grieved when his only sister and her small daughters left Wales. I will not see of them again, my three good girls. One shell is for him. Rumney Valley graveyard, no marker. I bend with my cousin to smooth aside varnish colored leaves. There is an age old tree, a sentry, you. You plathro, tree of darkness, silence. We balance on uneven earth, raised roots that reach unseen to our kinsmen's loosened bones. I kneel, push the serrated point of shell through lawn. It sheds radiant flaked pearl on umbered grass, a delicate constellation. Who is haunting whom? Uh, so this is just a little, hopefully, Ars Poetica written for other poets who like to dive down. Uh, there's a word in the title, colliery, you might know. That's a word for mine works in the UK. After driving past my family's colliery, now erased, Breath Dear Wales. Like the Welsh pony, this heart, wild once, bred for descent, depth, ever farther, down, air like onyx, animal patience that carries what is mined from the hidden toward light, return, ascent, endured for the boon, what is buried, 
forged in fierce time, an eon of heat, a hard won bounty. So I'll just finish with this one little poem. It'll take you away to Montana, although I did work on it in Wales and I, I traded this poem for a recipe for Welsh cakes. It's called Traveling the Old Stage Trail and the Old Stage Trail is a back kind of un unknown way past um, uh, a bird sanctuary for wild swans just outside Yellowstone. And I think if it's an old stage road, it probably is a palimpsest over indigenous pathways actually. Traveling the old stage road. You turn off the engine. We step out at the same time. Doors left open, dusty lane, only as wide as our car. After days of prairie, we've driven the narrowing roads into high country, find ourselves contained within a stand of trees, tall wands of slender white trunks. Breezes jostle the rustle grasses. From above, aspen leaves unpin, filter down, carry afternoon light through slanted shadow onto the car, road, onto our outstretched hands. Behind a stirring, and we turn. A dozen Appaloosa, half brown coats, half white, spilled with chestnut or black, part into two strings, surround us. They pass close enough to touch. We are invisible to all but one. She pauses, looks into my eyes, yours, joins the others, easing home. You say, memorize this. I murmur, aspen or birch, wind loosening gold, the company of horses. Again, you say, aspen, gold, spotted horse. Well, thank you for listening to my little tales. I appreciate it, all of you. <laughs> so different, just staring at yourself and sensing that people are out there. So that's that's it for us poets, and Robin's going to take over for now. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Yeah, Brandon Crawford would be proud. You cleaned up. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful poetry. Um, and thank you, Lee and Julie, Michael, Billy, and Nakia. Um, I have a funny message here. Oh, stop video. Wait a minute. That was weird. Um, I think because we hit the 6.30 mark, which is amazing. Uh, I thought for sure we wouldn't do that. We'd go over time. Anyway, your voices, poets, are so varied and so distinct. And you are extraordinary. Thank you so much. We also um, had a really good turnout. Thank you, participants. It's sort of evidence that um, the poetry community is alive and well. I'm glad we had this opportunity to bring everybody together. So um, your words will resonate beyond this event. This marks the end of the reading portion and we invite you to stay for the post event question and answer where poets uh, will answer your questions and we don't see any questions in the, the Q&A, so uh, participants, uh, if you have them, go for it. We'll give it a, a few moments. I, for one, um, would like um, Julie to please give us the name of the book that you recommended again. 
Oh yeah, uh, happy to. That's um, James Cruz anthology, How to Love the World, Poems of Gratitude and Hope. Poems of Gratitude and Hope. Yeah, and there's just such, there's there's so many poems in there and they're mm -hmm. um, just quite a variety of tone and content and um, it's really, really wonderful. Okay, and um, I did have one more question. I wanted to ask Nakia because I was curious what the uh, Inlandia Institute is. You know, uh, Nakia um, is the literary laureate of that institution, which um, is located in Southern California in the Inland Empire. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a transplant here to Santa Cruz um, and in Southern California, it's not LA, it's, it's in um, San Bernardino and Riverside, that's the Inland Empire. So one of the, the bigger literary organization is Inlandia. And Inlandia is, they sponsor poetry readings, they do um, workshops, um, they are doing a whole bunch of things uh, just to kind of support poets. And the laureateship program was one of the ones that they created because they didn't have a laureateship in that area at all. There was no, no library sponsoring a poet laureate um, in the Inland Empire, which is Riverside and San Bernardino. And so um, I'm the fourth one since they started. Um, there's another one now, I was from 2016 to 2018. Uh, and it was, it was really an honor um, to be chosen because we got to do a bunch of stuff like the Tuskegee, um, Tuskegee Airmen poetry event was really good. We got to do one for blues poetry, women in blues poetry. It was just really a lot of fun. And a chat book series where we made books together. So we got to do a lot of, a lot of really, really fun things. Um, so yeah, so, but if, if you guys, I have a website too. So if, if anybody, if you look me up um, and you can always reach out if you don't have any questions or anything like that. But I am working with um, the Hive Poetry now with Julie Murphy, uh, we are kind of like what sister bees or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and Billy, Billy was a bee for a long time. I'm hoping you make some guest appearances, Billy. No, I've, I've been busy. I'm like a hive uh, emeritus at this point. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah. So Once awesome. a bee, always a bee. Yeah. There you oh, go. great. We have a question for Lee. How long have you been writing poetry and what keeps you inspired? That's from Patrick Pierce. Thanks, Patrick. Been writing ever since the mid seventies. In uh, I started in Indiana when I lived there with friends. And what keeps me going? Uh, I guess driving long distances across the country without a radio. <laughs> You've got to say something. So you just start reciting. Um, just something to do with my mind because it's really important to do something with my mind and uh, I'm fixed on this. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah. So, um, Carrie Andre is asking how you learn to read your poetry, how you get the cadence into the, into the language, your heartfelt emotions, how you pace it, anybody. Repetition, practice, real, asking yourself, what's the important word in this line? Mm -hmm. What about you, Michael? How do you learn to read your poetry? Well, you know, I was writing in San Francisco in the early 60s, and it was one constant poetry reading for a couple of years there. And I think, as Lee says, repetition and reading you have to read everything aloud mm -hmm. yeah i i read aloud quite a lot and um, i read my own poems when i'm writing them aloud i often can't get the next line without reading everything up to that line so part of that you know cadence kind of comes even in the composing of the poem you know, I would, I would add, uh, go ahead and record your own voice on your phone. 
And also listen to your favorite um, poets. I've been listening to Tracy K. Smith lately. <laughs> Excellent. And then I wanted to add that, you know, one of the beautiful things about poetry is that it has music in it. Um, it has music in the meter, it has music in the words. And so, you know, if you kind of come at a poem or look at a poem, like a piece of music, um, you know, you're going to want to read it, you're going to want to experience it in these multiple ways. And it's, it's really nice to have that other register to be able to hear the words, not just see them on the page. So, you know, definitely something to try, like everyone is saying, read your poem aloud, read other poems aloud, um, and just really play around with words. That's, for, that's how I come into poetry, <laughs> through the sound. Thank you. I, so I want to go ahead say that um, a couple of people have mentioned that they were they joined late. And if you're not watching the chat, um, this recording will be published on YouTube and you will get a link. If, if you registered for the event, you'll get a link and you'll be able to see the whole thing. Yeah. Well, okay, I see no more questions and Kurt's gonna take us out. Take it away, Kurt. Okay, so am I on? Can you hear You're me? On. Okay, um, so uh, I just would like to thank all of the poets um, that shared their poetry tonight. It was really extraordinary. And, um, and I think one of the things about the poetry is how when a poet is reading, how it, it can touch each of us in our own way with our own experience, how we relate to the things that they're bringing to life in their, in their poetry. And I liked what Nakia said about how it's, you know, it's the, one of the beautiful things is it's like music. And um, I know I, I wrote down kind of, you know, I was just going to thank the poets, you know, individually by their names, but each one of you uh, touched me personally um, a great deal. And so when Nakia was reciting her poem about muddy water and the, the mule, the black woman and the backbone, um, my daughter-in-law is a black woman and is the backbone of her family with my, my son and their their grands, our grandson, Keanu, who was born at the beginning of this 2020, which started out good for us with him being born. Um, and then things changed. But, um, uh, but I, I was really moved by the power of, of all of your poems, but especially that one for me in my experience. And then Billy, when you talked about the, the objects and the butter uh, and your washing machine in your house, I've been a big proponent of I treat all of our belongings as animate objects, basically, or that they have a soul. You know, you imbibe a lot of energy into them. And, and um, I remember reading about um, that when I studied Carl Jung, like years ago in college, and he talked about that, about how the inanimate objects had energy and, and uh, when he had neglected them, that he could feel it, you know, he'd walk in and a pot would drop from the, the hanger or something. And um, so I, I really appreciated that. And then Michael, um, I always appreciate your poems. And when you talked about the big frog and the crickets, uh, I mean, your poem was very powerful, but those little things, um, as you know, we lost our home in Bonnie Dune in the fire this last August. And the frogs in the spring and the crickets in the summer was always a, a, a big thing in the redwoods up there. And uh, Julie, with your poem, I am so was so moved by your grief with your husband, but the hope that was in there too. And that's, you know, fortunately we only lost all of our possessions in our home, but um, I just, I had a wonderful guitar also. And I just, my heart goes out to you over your husband and you were so beautiful in the way you expressed your grief and the hope that was also part of your experience. 
And the redwoods in the background, we had a beautiful redwood grove that this week we've been cutting down all the burned trees. There's still some that are gonna be there, but um, it just it just brought back, uh, you know, I think it's the, it's, it's the hope that's within all that kernel of, of grief that is, it keeps us going. And I'm, I just can't imagine losing a loved one, but, and then Lee, what can I say? I thought that was your best reading ever, dude. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, oh, you reminded me of like, I was thought it was like at a Shakespeare festival or something. Oh, and, and uh, you. uh, yeah, you're welcome. And I, I know you touched on it in your first poem, but, but Lee lost his wife suddenly just a few years ago as well. And um, my heart, you know, has been just, you know, I could hear that in all of your, your poems tonight. Um, and uh, Kim, you know, when you finished with your fire poem, of course, that kind of, you know, uh, like I say, we lost our, our home in the, in the CZU lightning fire. And one of the big things that we had up there that some of which I was able to um, find in the ashes was my great aunt collected abalone shells on the on the beach and, and there was always a big thing. We had all these abalone shells and we have some, you know, right here uh, with us that we were able to find in the ashes. And um, so I just think that all of you did such a great job and, um, and it, it, you know, for the Zoom poetry reading, the first one ever, hopefully the last, um, it was awesome. And it was probably my favorite poetry reading, one of them ever, and uh, of the 27 years. So um, thank you all so much for being here and thank everybody for listening. And um, I think the lastly, um, I just want to remind everyone that if uh, the, the Friends of the Farm and Garden have been supporting the apprenticeship program and the staff, uh, and doing these community events for uh, you know over 50 years now. And so if you'd like to become a member or donate, you can go to the uh, donation link in the chat, uh, chat, whatever it is, the chat place. And, um, and you, can, you can help contribute to keep it going. But um, so thanks again to everybody. And also special thanks to Robin Summer for, she's been instrumental in putting this all together for over 13 years. And uh, she's just, you know, kind of the backbone, backbone of the whole thing. And, uh, and Delise also our, our uh, president of the Farm and Garden uh, was totally instrumental in helping us and Robin create this Zoom version of the event, which seems to have gone off pretty flawlessly. So that's, that's really great. So hopefully we'll see you next year in the garden. And uh, thanks again, all you poets. You're just like extraordinary. So see you then. yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, bye.